honor the Lord and just await in his presence. we're looking at the day of his power and divine exchange. But before we do that, there's just a few things I believe that's important that we just highlight from these past few weeks that we have been covering because the Lord is building something special here. And this is what he's emphasizing to us. And that the building blocks that have to be laid first, we've been covering the first week we talk about the, the glory of God returning to the house of God. We talked about dreaming with God. We talked about opening the storehouses of heaven. Last week we talked about unlocking the destiny of nations. And so what the Lord is doing in our midst here, he's putting building blocks in place to lay a foundation. And if we could open our spiritual eyes to see what he's doing in the realm of the spirit through these gatherings, we would be astonished at what we're part of. Because it's bigger than we realize. I remember 2012 where I received a prophetic word from a man I'd only met once prior to that, and he said something that's always stuck with me, and I thought that's a huge statement. And I didn't know the guy, he didn't know much about what we're building, but he said, what you're building is like Noah's ark. And he said, you need to understand the impact of what God is calling you to do. He didn't know that we had plans to build what God is calling us to build, and this is the first stage of what we're establishing. But week on week, as the Lord reveals more and more of the, the mandates, the heavenly assignments that he's giving us, week by week, more and more I realize the magnitude of what he's calling us to do. And today is another very significant day of what we're going to establish. So what we're building and establishing here is heaven culture. It's a very different culture from what the church is used to and very different to what we see in society. But when you establish a heaven culture, then you get heavenly results. And one of the key things that I've been emphasizing over these weeks is the aspect of the depth of God's presence that's going to begin to return to his house. And what I mean by that is people walking into a gathering like this, and we'll be talking about this place of a divine exchange, people walk in with sin, iniquity, transgression, and they leave with salvation and forgiveness. People walk in with sickness, disease, life-threatening conditions, and they leave with health. People come in with heaviness, mental health issues, depression, all those type of things, and they leave with the joy of the Lord. And this is what we're building and establishing here in this place. So the Lord is laying important foundations in these first few weeks. And as we do this, then we begin to see what God wants to do, the bigger picture of what God wants to do in our midst. And so the day of his power, very important scripture here in Psalm 110 verse 3 just the first part. Your people will be willing in the day of your power. So what is the day of his power? It's not a 24-hour period as some would think when you see a date 
scripture tells us that a day to the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. And so we're not talking about a 24 hour time period here. What we're talking about is God has a schedule. God is outside of time, he's in eternity as we know. But there is a timeline where we have, for example, Christ coming to the earth the first time to die for our sin, then Christ returning for us. And in between, we're somewhere in between. And somewhere along that timeline as well, there is the day of his power. And I gave the example a few weeks ago about the body parts storehouse in heaven. And I want to use that example because it'll be easier to explain the day of his power when I remind ourselves of that particular storehouse. And there's a storehouse in heaven that has body parts in it. And this, these body parts are in order to bring healing and health to people in the earth. And I explained how when Christ comes back, the old order tells us in Revelation, old order ends. There's no more sickness, dying, there's no more pain, suffering, disease, all the former things it tells us have passed away. So when Christ comes back, we no longer need the items that are in the body part storehouse in heaven. It's a supernatural storehouse. Scripture talks about storehouses in heaven, glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And so we no longer need those body parts when Christ comes back and there is no more sickness and disease. And the day of his power, when we think about when Christ comes back and establishes his rule in the earth, He's all powerful, all glorious, all nations will serve him. There wouldn't be the same demonic influences in the earth. We wouldn't need the power of God to the extent that we need the power of God now. And in short, what does that mean? That means that we, in our time, the day of his power, is our generation where we're going to see the greatest demonstration of the power of God that we have ever seen. You think about the time of Moses with the parting of the Red Sea and all the signs, miracles, and wonders that happened in Egypt. We think about Elijah with the incredible miracles he did, Jesus and his disciples when they walked in water and multiplied the food, raised the dead, blind eyes, opened all these types of amazing things. And Jesus says this, greater works will you do because I go to the Father. So even the works of power that we have seen in the past, we're going to see even greater works in our time. What we're going to see in our generation is the final and greatest demonstration of the power of God the world has ever seen. Why are we going to see such a demonstration of power? It's because there's going to be the removal of the gray area, atheism. It will no longer be a case of all these different views and perspectives out there. It'll be very simple, for God or against God. This gray area of is God real, science, evolution, those things will be removed from the table. The demonstration of God's power will be so clear, it will be very simple. Choose God or reject him. There's no debate about is God real, what's going on. You can imagine the time of Elijah when he calls down fire on Mount Carmel. Who was going to debate at that point that God is real? All the types of miracles, even with Moses, with all the plagues that he called down and in the Red Sea parting, who at that point is going to ask the question of is God real? And that was back then. Remember, we live in a greater covenant because of what Christ did. And he says, greater works will you do. So we're coming to a time where the demonstration of God's power will be so great that the gray area will be removed. There wouldn't be debates about, is God real, atheism, all those things. Those things will not be an issue anymore. It will be very simple for people. Do you want God or do you not want God? That's the day of his power. And we can move on to the next scripture because I want to apply this to each and every one of Matthew 11, verse 11. Powerful, incredible scripture that when we begin to think about the scripture, what it says is, it says, up until John the Baptist, there was none greater up until John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than him. What does that mean? Incredibly, it means even if you're sitting here today and you're listening and those who watch in the future and you think, I am the weakest Christian, I'm the smallest believer, I can't do anything, I'm weak, I have no potential. Even if you think that, scripture tells us that you're greater than John the Baptist, that you have greater potential than John the Baptist. That's what the scripture is saying here. Up until John the Baptist, there was none greater, but he was least in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of heaven. 
is greater than John the Baptist. Why? Because we now have Christ in us. In the Old Testament, they did not have Christ in them. They did not have that potential of Christ in them. But we now, all of us, we all have Christ in us. So we have a greater potential than even John the Baptist. That's what that scripture is saying. So it doesn't matter where you think you are, whether you feel like you're the weakest Christian in the world, the reality is because you have Christ in you, you have the greatest potential. Because it tells us in the book of Daniel as well that those who know their God in the last days will do great exploits. This is a season we're about to see exploits like you could not imagine. Let me give some practical examples that will expand our minds. Begin to prepare your minds and your hearts and expectations. Increase your expectations because it tells us greater works will we do. Greater works than Jesus. Look at what the things that Jesus did. He says, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly more. It says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard. God has reserved miracle signs and wonders for our generation that we could never conceive. Try and think about the craziest, most outrageous miracles that you can imagine. Mass resurrection. Dozens of people resurrected at the same time. Try and imagine that. Believers going to the local hospital and every sick person healed. Deaf and blind schools emptied because of a believer walks in there. A pupil prays in school and the entire school is touched with the glory of God. Teachers everywhere weeping under repentance. All the sick people, everyone healed and delivered. Believers walking, just going down to the shops, worshiping God inside of them. Suddenly they look around, the power of God has fallen all over that shopping mall. And people everywhere being healed, delivered, set free. They hardly even did anything, they only praised God. Just begin to imagine that's the level of glory and power and signs of wonders that this generation is going to see. And far greater than that, there will be believers who will be bold enough to command the weather to change and it will change. These things have happened before, so it's important when you look at scripture and you see some of the examples I've given. Remember, we're going to see something greater. What was about to happen? greater demonstration than anything we've seen before. So even if you see a record of it in the scripture, remember what's coming is greater. It's a, the scripture tells us the glory of the latter head will be greater. So greater works will be done. Daniel says exploits. All these things. So when you see signs of wonder that happened before, Joshua told the sun to stand still. Elijah said there will be no rain for three years, but there's no rain for three years. Peter walked on water. These are outrageous miracles, signs and wonders. What we're coming to is something even greater than that. And the Lord wants all of us to be part of it. That's what the scripture is talking about here. Even if you think you're the least believer, that does not stop you. That does not disqualify you. Remember with Gideon, when the Lord went to him and said, Mighty man of valor, I want to use you to deliver all the people of Israel. And he looked at himself and said, But I'm the least in my father's house. What hope can there be through my life? And what did God do? God used him, reduced the number from over 30,000 to just 300. We all know the story. To over just 300 and delivered them, the children of Israel, with such a small number. God has never needed huge numbers of people. He can use a remnant. Throughout scripture, he uses a remnant. And throughout scripture, we see people that most people in the world today would disqualify, would reject, would overlook and say, they can't be used by God. They've made too many mistakes. God picks those same people, transforms them, and does great exploits with them. That's what God can do. And so all of us qualify when we talk about the day of his power. And he who is even the least in the kingdom of God, we all qualify. All it takes is the scripture before that said, people will be willing in the day of his power. That's all he asks for us to say yes. Just to simply say, yes, Lord, I am willing in the day of your power. Because we are now in the day of God's power. The final and greatest demonstration of power we have ever seen. That's the time frame that we are in. The scripture talks about in the last days I will pour out my spirit and all flesh. That's the time scale and time frame that we're in. So it's important to lay that foundation first. We're also going to look now at original design. Before we look at some scriptures about the divine exchange and what is going to happen, not just in this place and up, but other places, that God raises up around the world. Look at the divine exchange in Isaiah 61. 
But first, it's important to look at the original design to understand the dynamics of what is going on. When we talk about people receiving the Lord, we talk about the Lord healing, delivering, and setting people free. Why is he doing that? What is, what is going on? What's the dynamics? What we need to understand is, we, we mentioned last week about our destiny. People wonder about what's my destiny. And scripture says we have all been predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. We're all to look like Jesus. And so when we want to understand God's bigger picture is what he, why is he delivering someone? Why is he healing someone? Why is he restoring a life? If we want to understand what's going on behind that, and it is important to know this so that we see, when we see the patterns of what God's going to be doing all over the world, we understand what he's doing. He's restoring man back to his original design. When we look in the Garden of Eden and the way Adam and Eve were created and how they walked with God, that's God's original design and original plan. A lot of times we can view things and God's nature and his work through the fallen nature of man. That's the equivalent of you buy a brand new item that you assemble, you have the instruction manuals, then the thing breaks and you just begin to patch that thing together without even using the instruction manual and then things begin to fall apart. That's what we can do many times. What we need to do is go back to the beginning, look at the instruction manual of what was the original design and intent. And that's what we need to do because sometimes we can miss God's character and his word because we look at the fallen world. We look at the, the state of our lives. We look at the state of what's happening in the world and we view everything through that perspective. That's not the correct way to look at it. We need to look at it through scripture and God's original design. And so when we talk about, again, it's easy to use the body parts storehouse in heaven to help to understand this particular aspect. When Adam and Eve were created, they had two perfectly working eyes. The arms, everything were working perfectly. So when we see today this body part still has been emptied all over the world, it's because you see someone without a hand and God heals the hand. What is he doing? He's restoring that person back to God's original design. When they were created, there was nothing missing. Everything was complete. And so when we see healing and the level of healing and signs and wonders that we're about to see in the earth, like never before. In some past revivals, we saw huge levels of healing during those few years of revival, and then it was almost stopped. And in little places, some places around the world would continue in sporadic healings, and some ministries can continue on in healing, but it's not something that's widespread or well-known, and especially in, in Western nations, even here in Scotland, it's not something that's widespread that you hear of signs, miracles, and wonders on a regular basis. We should be hearing that, because that's the way the church was birthed in the book of Acts, that the signs, miracles, and wonders on a daily basis, it says people were added to the number of believers. That's supposed to be happening on a regular basis, but we don't see it. But what's going to be happening again is we're going to see so many people healed. Many times you hear about people praying for people, and it's only some that get healed, some don't get healed, etc. We're coming into a time where it will be 100% record. That's the level of power, God's power, where Believers are praying for people and every time, because when we read scripture, there were many times that Jesus went to places, and, and scripture specifically highlights this for our benefit. It says, Jesus healed them all. All those who are afflicted and oppressed by the devil, Jesus healed them all. That's in there for our benefit. And when we say we're going to walk like Jesus, then we need to be the same as that. When we get to that place where when we're praying for people, all people are healed and delivered. Again, we haven't seen this in the past, but very few anointed people in the past have walked in that level where it's everyone is healed, but that's very, very small as we know. But we're coming to a time where that body part room in heaven will be empty because when Christ comes back, we don't need that anymore. There is no more sickness and disease. And so this is where believers, we all need to begin to rise and say, Lord, use me. Because God wants to restore man back to its original design. So when we look at healing, when we look also, it's important to mention because we're going to be talking about the garden room of heaven. Another very important storehouse that will be begin to be emptied into the earth in our time. And that will be covered in Isaiah 61 and also we're going to look at Zechariah as well. The garden room in heaven. Why is this important? Again, we have to go back to the beginning. When Adam and Eve were created by God, 
they had a covering of God's glory. They were not naked. They were not spiritually naked. But what happened once they sinned, immediately they most noticed that they had lost the covering, that they were naked spiritually as well. They suddenly noticed their physical nakedness as well. What's going on there? Because there's a covering of God's glory that we're all supposed to carry. Every human being on planet Earth is supposed to be covered by God's glory. That's why you read in the book of Revelations, it talks about those who say that you say that you're rich, but you're poor. You say that you can see, but you're blind. You say that you're clothed, but you're naked. What's that talking about? It's not talking about physical nakedness. It's talking about the spiritual covering that we're supposed to have. Adam and Eve were covered in the glory of God, covered in the light of God's glory. And that's his original design, is for man to be covered with God's glory. They lost that when they sinned. And so that needs to be restored. Garments and coverings, spiritual garments and coverings need to be restored in people's lives. And so that's one storehouse in heaven that will be open, that is open now, that we're going to see garments now. Because you read it throughout scripture, garments of praise, garments of salvation, robes of righteousness, there's even footwear as well. All types of things, all types of coverings that we're some spiritual coverings that we are supposed to have. And so that's why scripture says when the Lord looks at people, he sees a spiritual nakedness because if they don't have that covering, they don't have the Lord. There's even there's robes of righteousness, there's cloaks of humility, all types of spiritual clothing and spiritual covering we are supposed to acquire, we are supposed to have upon our lives. There's even footwear. The scripture talks about our feet shone about with the gospel, the good news gospel of peace. What is that? There's covering that you can have in your feet that accelerates you both spiritually and both in the natural. There's things that you can be covered with that affect you spiritually and in the natural. Now I know some of these things are deep and may be hard to grasp, but it's okay. The Holy Spirit will help people in time because you're going to see these realities that I'm saying now. They may be new things, but we're going to see these realities because it talks about the whole armor of God. So what is that? It talks about the helmet of salvation. If we can see in the realm of the spirit, there's actually a spiritual helmet that you're supposed to have. That when a believer is born again, that gets put on. And when people don't understand salvation, because these are some of the spiritual dynamics, but it's important to know these things. Your spiritual helmet of covering of your head, your helmet can be slanted. That's when people have either incomplete conversions or they don't understand the salvation. So one day they wake up and born again. The next day, because the enemy feels uh, has condemned them, they feel negative. I'm not saved today. I'm saved another day. This is what happens. That's when the helmet of salvation isn't properly fastened on your head. So you know, I know who I've believed and I know he's able to keep what I've committed to him until that day. So you know that you have the Spirit of God. You know that you're born again. So your helmet of salvation is secure. So all these things are very important. It talks about the breastplate of righteousness. If we don't have that correctly there, then when the enemy shoots a dart off, God doesn't love you, you're not forgiven, you're not going to make it to heaven. If you don't have that breastplate of righteousness, suddenly you begin to question, oh, I'm condemned, I'm a bad Christian, God doesn't love me. This is why we need to have all this. These are all spiritual coverings. It's all there in scripture as we know. But this is just so we begin to understand these dynamics because there'll be occasions where the Lord will open your spiritual eyes and you will see these garments, you will see these coverings, you will see people standing with the sword of the Spirit. The scripture says the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, because we're in a battle. As we all know, we're in a spiritual warfare. And so these are all different clothings, garments, coverings, warfare items that we need to put on in order to walk the Christian life correctly. So we can go on now to the divine exchange as Isaiah 61. Thank you. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, or the poor. He sent me to bind up the broken hearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Going to To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and we to do in that today, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, 
that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Verse 47. And they shall build the old waste places, they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. And just verse 10 as well. Verse 10 is very important. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful, my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with robes of righteousness, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. So let's touch on some of these aspects there. We've just been talking about the garments, the coverings that we are to have. And we see here the garment of salvation and a robe of righteousness. These are spiritual coverings. These are real things. And again, if the Holy Spirit was to open your spiritual eyes, you would see that you have this on you. You have a garment of salvation. When you're born again and you receive Christ, you're no longer spiritually naked like because of what happened with Adam and Eve, because of sin and separation from God. There's no longer a covering. But when you receive Christ, you have a garment of salvation and a robe of righteousness is put over you as well. So I just wanted to emphasize this aspect of the divine clothing, the spiritual covering that we are to have over ourselves. Because we're coming to a time now where a person can walk into a gathering like this, and before they come to Christ, they're spiritually, they're uncovered, spiritually naked. They don't have salvation. They walk into a place like this. The presence of God touches them, conviction of sin. They receive Christ, and then they are then covered with the garment of salvation. The robe of righteousness is put upon them to receive salvation. So this is a place of divine exchange because people come in with a spiritual nakedness, with a sin, with their iniquities, the rebellion against God, they come in in that state and they leave in a different state. People come in with sickness, disease, health conditions, terminal illnesses, all types of things. They come in with that and instead the body parts room in heaven is empty out. They receive what they need in a physical body to be made whole, to be healed, and they leave different. So this is like a divine exchange, this place. And I believe God is raising up places like this all over the earth. That when people will walk into the presence of God, missing certain things, people will come in dry, empty, feel far away from God. They will come in like that and receive receive a touch from the Holy Spirit, an infilling of the Holy Spirit, and leave filled with the Holy Spirit and on fire. People will come in with depression, heaviness, that's why we read that part of the scripture says, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, because people will come in with demonic oppressions, demonic spirits working in their life, they will come in bound up, that's why it says the prison doors will be opened as well. People will be set free, people will come in oppressed, demonically bound, depression, whatever it may be, they will come in in that state, then they will get a garment of praise the Lord will put upon them, and that person who was so down, so heavy, will leave praising the Lord, leave on fire for the Lord. People will come in empty and leave filled, because this is the year of the favor of the Lord, and we will be declaring some of those things at the end as well, because the time has come where you look at the state of society, look at the world, look at the church, look at everything that's happening out there right now. The need cannot be any greater. The need is huge out there. And that's why it's time for people now, for the church to rise up and be a solution. Because if we do not rise up and be a solution, I've said it many times this week, if we do not rise up at this time and be a solution, millions of people will not just be, be starving and dying, millions of people will be lost for eternity. It's now time for the church to rise up and shine and be a solution like never before. And that's why divine exchanges like this place is so, so important. Because this is the year when the spirit of the sovereign Lord is resting upon his people to a greater measure. The presence of God in places like this will be so intense. People will walk in in one state and leave with another. And we'll be looking at the mind as well. If you can go on to... Zechariah chapter 3. And this is also very, very important as well. And this gives us a glimpse into the realm of the Spirit regarding these garments that I'm talking about today. The Scripture actually lets you see 
what I'm talking about here today. It's not just something we're talking about naturally and have to visualize or understand with our spiritual eyes. We're given a glimpse into the realm of the spirit of what's happening regarding these garments and this exchange that needs to happen. This scripture here is so, so powerful. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the king. So we see here, Joshua was a high priest now. This is quite incredible to think that this is a high priest that we're talking about. This is meant to be the holiest person in the whole of Israel. So it's not just one of the Israelites at this point. This is the high priest, the person who's supposed to represent Israel before God, who goes before God once a year on the Day of Atonement to sacrifice so that all of Israel might be made holy. And here he is in the realm of the spirit. Again, this is getting a glimpse into what I'm talking about, into the storehouses of heaven, into the divine exchange of what's happening in the realm of the spirit. This is like what you're going to read here and what you're going to see here is exactly what will be happening when people are coming into gatherings like this. So this high priest on the earth He's the high priest standing before God. He's the one representing the people of God before Israel. And here we are. He is there standing in the spiritual realm, in the heavenly realm, because scripture tells us we are seated in heavenly places. So this is a glimpse into the spiritual realm. It's important to keep that in the back of the mind here. But in the natural, he is this high priest that's supposed to be the holiest person in Israel. And yet he has filthy garments. And so what is going on there? At that particular point in Israel, there was sin in Israel. And so even the high priest was in sin. Even he was not living correctly. And I mentioned this a number of weeks ago that if we come to God in prayer, we want to approach the throne of God, the scripture tells us boldly. If there's sin in our lives, if we're living in an incorrect way, it can even be a wrong mentality that's not godly, carnal thinking, fleshly thinking, or sinful habits, places we're going, things we're listening to, those, that type of thing. If we're doing that, what we need to understand is this. If we go on to verse 4, what happens in the realm of the spirit is the enemy actually begins to accuse us. The enemy can stand there in the realm of the spirit and he actually stands there and he objects to our prayers. That's important for us to grasp this because when you want to pray and have your prayers answered before God, if there's sin in your life, the devil will stand there and he will accuse you. So you're presenting your petition before God. God, I want this blessing. I want this breakthrough. Lord, I need this situation to change. If you have sin in your life, if there's something wrong there in your life that you would change, that you refuse to repent of it and deal with in your life, the enemy is standing there in the realm of the spirit before the Lord saying, I object. He does not, or she does not deserve that blessing, that breakthrough, do not change that situation because they're in sin in this area. He objects. And more times than we would care to realize or hope is that he actually wins those cases. He doesn't stand there for fun to accuse just for the sake of it. He wins a lot of those cases because believers sometimes they're not even aware that there's sin in their life but the enemy is fully aware of the sin in their life he stands there to accuse because when he can find something to accuse you of in the sin in your life which is exactly what was happening here with the high priest when he's before the throne of god there in the realm of the spirit the enemy's standing right there saying no he should not be blessed he does not deserve this Look at his filthy garments. Look at the sin in his life. He does not deserve this. And they would not get the blessing. So it's important that we lock that away and keep that in the back of our mind. What one thing I do on a daily basis, it's a practical thing. I encourage people to do this. Even as I'm waking up, I say, Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Lord, I just pray that you forgive me of every sin, thoughts, words, actions, things I'm not even aware of. Lord, I just ask you that you wash me in your blood. And I encourage people, it's keeping short account, daily repentance, keeping in that place of purity because we can do things sometimes, we can sin, we can transgress without even realizing it. It might not just be the obvious thing of we've got angry at someone and we've shouted and we've, we've 
said something to someone that's abusive, it might not be something an obvious sin like that, or we've lied or we've stolen something. It's not always an obvious sin. It can be secret sins, it can be small things. And that's why I encourage people, keep those short accounts, even as you're rising and you're connecting with God and praying before you even leave your bed. I encourage people, just ask them, say, Lord Jesus, wash me, you God, cleanse me, thoughts, words, actions, things I'm not even aware of. Because if you don't, and it's unconfessed sin, unresolved sin, you can be sure the enemy is fully aware of it. You may not even be aware where you've crossed the line, but the enemy will be fully aware and he will point when you then want to pray, God, I want a blessed day. God, I want this breakthrough for my family. Lord, can you answer this prayer? The enemy standing right there saying, I object. God, no. They do not deserve that blessing because of X, Y, Z. Then we don't get our prayers answered. And then this is the problem. People then go before God and say, God, why has this not happened? Why has this not been answered? Well, it's because of the sin in our lives. So it's important that we touch on that as well. And we keep that in the back of our mind as well. Because... When we come before him in prayer and intercession, it's important to realize that the enemy will try to accuse and try to block our prayers. If we can go to verse 4, Zechariah 3, verse 4. Each and every one of us wants to keep short accounts before the Lord and asking him and acknowledging and saying, Lord, search me, know my heart, try me, see if there's any wicked way in me. Is there anything in my heart, anything in my life that will hold me back? This is what the angel said. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused your iniquity to pass from thee, and will clothe thee with a chain of raiment. And this is what we're talking about today. That's a divine exchange. The filthy garments are removed, and a change of raiment, a change of garment. The garment of righteousness is now put on this priest. And again, this is glorious that the Lord has given us in his word a glimpse into the realm of the spirit of what's happened because this is the high priest of Israel that's there physically in the temple offering sacrifices but this is what's happening in the realm of the spirit when he's trying to get prayers answered it's been objected to by the enemy because of his filthy garments but those garments are removed and the sin is taken away and he's given new garments and this is the divine exchange that will be happening in this place and other places that people will come in with sin in their lives, iniquity in their lives, spiritually uncovered, no glory of God upon them. They will come in in that state and in the realm of the spirit because of the glory and the presence of God here, or it could be they are laying on of hands in prayer. The Lord puts a new garment upon them and they become pure and holy. And then from that place, they then intercede. They then ask God, Lord, I need this blessing. Lord, can you change this situation? The enemy is then silenced. It's the blood of Jesus that silences the enemy. And that's why it's so important that we walk in daily repentance. We can go on to verse 5. And I said, let them set for me the fear mitre upon his head. That's a turban upon his head. So they set the turban upon his head and clothed him with garments. It's very important because this is talking about head covering. Again, this is the realm of the spirit. This is a divine exchange that's going on in the realm of the spirit. So again, when people are walking in here physically in the natural, in whatever state they're in, in the realm of the spirit, this is what's happening. There's an exchange going on. So I want to touch on this with regarding our minds because even though he's had his garments changed and his sin forgiven, why is it important that he has a turban or mitre that says they put on his head? This is so important here because it can be easily missed if we don't ask the question. Well, if you've got garments on, why do you need a head covering? And this is what I mean by the, the garment room in heaven. It has all types of things. It has armory, it has clothing, it has footwear, it has headwear. That's what this is talking about here. Why does he need to put on something on his head? This is because of his mind. This high priest, again, let's go back to the natural. This is a spiritual realm. This is what's happening behind the scenes. Let's go back to the natural. He's had his garments put on, new clean garments put on. But if he doesn't have something put on his head, his mindset, his perspective remains the same. In other words, 
after all these great things that the Lord is doing in the realm of the Spirit, and his mind is not changed, he will go back and do the same things he was doing before, end up back in sin with the enemy accusing him, and again the filthy garments bringing him back to square one. New headwear have to be put on his head so that his mind was renewed. So now, as he is ministering, this is the natural now, that's the spiritual, back in the natural, as he's ministering before the people, he has a new mindset, he has a new thinking. His perspective is different. Now he's not going back to sin, temptation, lies, deception, those things that brought about the filthy garments. He now knows, okay, no, this is the way to go. I'm clothed in new garments, but I have a new mind to know what direction to go in. If he doesn't have his mind renewed or a new um, turban put on his head, he has the old mindset, which means he goes back and does the old things and ends up back in the same situation. And again, why is that so important for us here? Because people are also going to walk in here like that. They may receive new garments, or they may, even as a believer, this one's even important for believers, because we're often talking about unbelievers coming in and receiving salvation, healing, and deliverance. But for believers, this is very important, because believers can come into a place like this, or gatherings that God is raising around the world, with the wrong mindset, wrong thinking, worldly thinking, stronghold in the mind, Scripture says, be not conformed, or do not be like the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You're changed by your mind being renewed. That's why he needed a turban on his head, because if he didn't, he could not change. He would go back and end up in the same place. So even as a believer, as you come in, and believers come into gatherings like this, some people need to have new head coverings so that they have a new mentality, a new mindset. Because if we don't have new mindsets, we will think the old way that we did before we were born again. And if we do that, we will live lives that are not reflective of Christ. As I mentioned before, our priority as believers is to know him, be like him, and make him known. Now, if we don't become like him, and we try to make him known, this is where we have the problem, as I mentioned before, about hypocrisy. Because as believers say, I know him, and they try to tell that to other people, but they're not like him. This is where we get the problem. We have to be like Christ. We have to think like him. We have to act like him. We have to speak like him. Where are we going? What are the people that we hang around with? What are we watching? There should be a difference between us and an unbeliever. And so this is why that mind is so important. This is why putting that turban on his head is so important. Because if the high priest has new garments, his filthy garments are taken away, the enemy can't accuse him, but then he goes back with the same mindset to minister as a priest with the old thinking, he ends up back in the old way, in the old sin, and next thing, the enemy has something to accuse him of. If we can go into verse 6 as well. So our mind, it's very, very important that our minds are renewed. So we allow the Lord, allow the Holy Spirit to put a new, new thinking, new mindset upon us. We can go on to verse 6. The reason I want to go on to the next verse or two is because to show the blessing and the promotion that comes when we obey the Lord in this area, when we have new garments that come on our lives, the benefits of having new garments, whether it's a believer or not. If you can go to verse 7, I said verse 7 on here. It's a key one for us. Because this verse shows the blessing. Verse 7, thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways and if you keep my charge, then you will judge my house and, I'll, and also keep my court, and I will give you places to walk among those that stand by you. So after he's been given a new mind, a new garment, the Lord is now giving him this command. If you will walk in my ways, now that you've been cleansed, now that you have a new mind, you now need to walk in my ways. Leave behind the old ways because that clearly is telling us that the, the high priest was not walking in the ways of the Lord. So he's now been told, now that you have a new mind, now that you have new covering, now walk in my ways, keep my requirements, and when you do this, here is a promotion. You will judge my house, or govern my house, keep my court, and I will give you a place to walk among these standing by here. And so this is to encourage us as well that what will happen when we allow the Lord to do a divine exchange in our life, not just for the unbelievers who will come in in the unprecedented harvest and revival that's pending in the nation, 
to indeed has begun in the nation, but also for believers. There is promotion there, because once we allow the Lord to renew our mind and change our garments, we then qualify for promotion. God can trust you with more. A believer who comes in, and in the past, they lived a standard Christian life, they were not a sinner, they lived a standard Christian life, little bit of fruit, but when they allow the Lord to renew their mind and shift them to new place, they will walk out after receiving a divine exchange like that. They will then meet with friends and family. They have a new garment, a covering of glory. They don't even need to witness to people. Everyone around them begin to weep with repentance. They're walking down the shopping mall. People are beginning to be healed and delivered all around them. They will pick up the word of God and even the most obscure scripture genealogies and those things that you would normally skip past. Suddenly you read that and it jumps out and you understand everything you're reading. You're having a time of worship and prayer before the Lord. Suddenly open vision, angels, all type of things begin to happen. Why? Because you've had an upgrade. Your mind, the garments that you're wearing has been an upgrade because there's always much, much more that the Lord has available for us. So I thought it was important to encourage us to realize that there is more and that there is promotion when we allow the Holy Spirit to change our old garments, to renew our minds. Because there's some things that God can only trust us with if our minds are renewed. He can't give us, he doesn't give us all these excess things that would ruin us. He will wait until we are ready, till we have the mind, till we have the spiritual capacity to deal with those things, then he will give it to us. But it's down to us to want the more. And so for believers who want more, believers who walk into this divine exchange, they will be hungry for more. The Lord will give them a new mind that suddenly has the capacity to understand revelations, mysteries, kingdom keys like they've never understood before. Many believers avoid the book of Revelation. <laughs> Many believers avoid that. They say it's too confusing. I can't understand it, etc. But when people begin to get new minds and they're touched powerfully by the Lord, suddenly they will pick up the book of Revelation and they will be able to understand mysteries that they can never understand before. So this is a place of divine exchange. This is a place where people are going to come in, they were spiritually naked before, they will receive the covering of the Lord. People who had all types of spiritual oppression, demonic oppression, demonic spirits, things going on in life, they will come in in that state, they will be delivered and they will leave in a different state. People will come in with the sicknesses, with the disease, with their condition, and they will leave. The divine exchange will happen in the presence of the Lord, or they are laying on a pan, whichever one the Lord decides to do at that point, and they will leave with health. People will come in with minds that cannot understand and grasp the things of the kingdom, the things of God, and they will leave with an understanding and a hunger for God. And the last part of this that I want to go on to is in Acts chapter 4, verse 32. The natural needs, the natural needs as well, divine exchange. It's very, very important. Because as we all know at the moment, if we've been keeping an eye on the news and all the things happening, the dire need out there that people have petrol prices, energy prices, food prices, people have lost their jobs. So there's a lot of pressure on people even before the pandemic. Now think about where we are today. And so as a divine exchange, this place has a particular mandate to go beyond the normal level of meeting needs. Now there's other storehouses, we prayed about that a few weeks ago, that Joseph, when Joseph was the time came when Joseph had to open the storehouses. We all know the story. For seven years, there was good harvest. And they had to gather it all in and they put it all in the storehouses. But then the point came where the people of Egypt went to Pharaoh and they said, Pharaoh, we're starving, we're hungry. Please, what, what are we supposed to do here? They said, go to Joseph and Joseph opened the storehouses. So prophetically, as an act of faith, we know that we did that a few weeks ago, open the storehouses of heaven and that will see a manifestation of provision coming into the house of God so that it can be used for the correct purposes. And we, we dealt with all that as well, the poverty mentality and the false prosperity mentality. And having that balance that there is a purpose for wealth, there is absolutely a purpose for abundance. But it's for the blessing of others, it's for meeting the needs of others. And when we look at what's happening in the world today, 
This is the greatest need that we've seen in our lifetime. The record high of prices of everything, food, petrol, etc. This is the now opening up an opportunity for the church to be a practical solution. I've been touching on all the spiritual aspects, the garments, the, the freedom, the, the outpouring of the spirit, but this is also the natural now. Because as we can see today around us, there's a great need in the natural as well. So we've touched on the spiritual, we're going to finish on the natural before we pray over some of these things and declare what the Lord wants us to declare here today before we finish. So let's look at the natural need. Because the church has now come to the point where we now have to be like the Joseph storehouses. The world is in such a state now where they need solutions from anywhere. It doesn't even matter where it comes from. If anyone brings them a solution right now, they'll take it. But the church is going to be a solution once again. And also for the practical, physical needs. So let's look at this first before we touch on a few things as we close today. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that of the things which they possessed were their own, but they had all things in common. Very, very important here. This is where the church is coming back to again. A oneness in understanding the purposes of the kingdom of God. Understanding that this time that we are in is a time for the church to rise and shine, like Isaiah 60 tells us, to be a solution. To understand that the resources that God gives, the abundance that God gives, is in order to be a solution. It's not so we can sit, I've said it many times, that we can sit with five mansions and five cars and ten yachts. No. Those things, even if someone has that, they should be seeing the need in the world right now and saying, I can meet the needs of multitude with the multiple millions that they have. They should see the need all around them and use some of that for the other people. That's pure Bible. Share it and give it to others. This is the way the church was birthed. No one thought that anything belonged to themselves. They recognized that if you have houses, if you have lands, and we see there that prosperity is a good thing. There's nothing wrong with prosperity because if those people didn't have several houses, they didn't have several lands, how could they meet the needs of other people? If they too were sitting there in one house and they had next to nothing, how could they meet the needs of those who were starving and in poverty? The brothers and sisters in Christ in the church. So we see here how those who had the wealth, they had the resources, they understood the purpose of the resources. It wasn't just for them, it was to be used for other people. Go to verse 33. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. So we see in the midst of that, great power was demonstrated. Great grace was upon the church. There was unity, there was provision, there was power, there was grace. This is the model of the church. This is the way the church is supposed to be. Again, when we look at original design, and we look at God's intention, again, it's important to look at this, not what we've experienced, not the state of the church, not the state of the world. We can view everything in biblical lenses. Those are not the correct lenses. Look at original design. The church was birthed in its pure form, correct form, the way the Father wants it, the scripture tells us. This is the model. That's church, not what we see today or what we've personally experienced. That's the model there. The power of God witnessing to the resurrection of Christ, the grace of God everywhere. No needy among them, as we go to verse 34. No needy among them. Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold. And we go to verse 35, the final verse there. And laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. If you want to see the blueprint for where the church is just stepping into, this is it here. This is the blueprint of the church here. The power of God manifests. The grace of God manifests. Oneness and unity there. Abundant need there. Those who had houses and land were able to sell houses and land so that the needs of other people were met. This is where the church is coming to again. Where the needs, people will come in here, as I've mentioned, the divine exchange. People will come in in poverty and lack. They don't have the needs that they, that they require, the things that they need. And the church 
will meet that physical need. Not just the spiritual need. Yes, people need salvation. They need deliverance. They need their garments changed. They need new mindsets. They need talking. All the things we touched on. But the need, we cannot hide away from the need. Just switch on the news and we will know this is the most desperate moment. I don't know if anyone has seen a more desperate moment in their lifetime. But it's as desperate as it gets. And this is the time where we're supposed to arise and shine for the glory of God. And so this is the time where, as believers, it's not just a case of simply looking at, okay, a simple food parcel, as we've mentioned before. It's not just about a food parcel. We want to go beyond that. Families who struggle, we want to be creating jobs for people. We want to be making a difference in people's lives beyond the basics. And God will provide the resources to do that. So this is a divine exchange. People will come in, they will say, look, we have no money for food. We can't clothe our children. We've lost our jobs. We can't pay for the electricity, the energy. We've had to sell the car. People will come in with great need. And we will even have a department that we say, okay, we'll speak to so-and-so. Any need that you have will be met. That's exactly what was happening in the birthing of the church. Where anyone who had abundance, they brought it and the needs of others were met. That's a divine exchange. And that's what will happen here. And that's how the church can begin to be a storehouse and a solution in this great time of need. So we can be excited that we can be part of that. And God will provide the resources. He will absolutely provide the resources for us to do that. So I'm just going to pray into a few things now that we to declare and to pray into the atmosphere here today to declare some of the things that we've touched on today before we close. Father, we just thank you, we praise you, we magnify you. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the mantle upon us, Lord, the mandate that we've been given today, O God, to release things, Lord, to release things in the atmosphere, to see things shift, O God. We just thank you and praise you, Lord. We thank you, Father, that this place is made of a divine exchange. And we just declare, Lord, this divine exchange is open to the kingdom business of the Father. This divine exchange is open to receive the people who have the needs of God that we're able to meet. That the garments of God, for those who are spiritually naked, Lord God Almighty, we thank you that they will be clothed, O God, with garments of salvation, robes of righteousness, a covering of your glory once again, Lord. And we proclaim, O oh God, this is the year of your favor. We proclaim this is the year of your favor. This is the year of the vengeance of Almighty God. This is the year that people receive the garment of praise for the spirit of heaven. This is the year that people come out of their prisons. This is the year of your power. This is the day of your power. We declare it. This is the day of your power. It's the time for the church to rise and shine like never before. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that this place is filled with your presence, ready, O oh God, for divine exchanges, for people to come in with the need and have that need met, whether it's spiritual or natural. We thank you, we praise you, Lord, we declare that in the mighty name of Jesus. The people, when they come in with filthy garments, they will leave, O oh God, with garments salvation, robes of righteousness, minds to be set free of God, turbans put on the heads of people of God, so that the minds are renewed, minds renewed. We thank you, Father, that you're restoring us, your church, your people, into the image of Christ, to the original design of God. We thank you that you've released your people in this season to be at the forefront of the solutions that are needed in the earth at this time. Holy Spirit, I just thank you, Lord. I just release renewed hope, 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 hope. The light of Christ, hope, hope, 
release hope in the mighty name of Jesus. There's people out there who need to catch this hope that we're releasing right now. Lord God Almighty, we release hope. Hope, hope, we release it in the mighty name of Jesus. Those with the mental health issues, those who are suicidal, we release hope. That hope that will catch them, oh God, before the enemy can do anything to their lives. Hope, we release it in the mighty name of Jesus. We release your grace, 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 oh God Almighty, to those struggling right now, struggling to hold on physically, financially. Release your grace, Lord, grace, grace, great grace. As there was great grace upon your church in the beginning, Lord, we release that great grace out into the atmosphere. For those struggling to feed their children, to clothe their children, sitting in freezing dark homes right now, we just release grace and hope. And for the churches in their areas to rise up and be a solution in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord. That garment room, the storehouse in heaven is open. The garments are pouring into the earth, pouring into the earth. So the divine exchange of the salvation is poured out across the earth. We thank you, Lord. People are being robed even now with righteousness. People are having their raiments changed even now. We thank you, God. Change the raiments of your people. Change the garments of your people, the garments of glory. Remove the filthy rags from us, O oh God, and put on new garments, put on new turbans on our heads. Give us new minds for this new season. Yes, Father, we just thank you. We praise you, Lord. That which you released in this place, Lord, we thank you, Father. That which you've commissioned for us to release today, Lord God, in accordance to your will. We thank you, God, it's released in the mighty name of Jesus. Everything you want is released today, Lord. We thank you. The day of your power. Divine exchange established in this place, Lord. We're ready, Lord, to see the manifestation of that, even as we've saw today what happened in the realm of the Spirit. We thank you, God. We're going to begin to see it in the natural as people. Come in, Lord God, that divine exchange will occur. Transformation and life testimonies will come forth and they will know that something has changed in their lives as they've entered into the presence of the Lord. We thank you and praise you for your anointing upon our lives, Lord. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your continued work, Lord. We thank you for what's been established and built today, Lord. You said we'll decree a thing and it will be established. We decree it today, Lord. It's the year of the favor the Lord, the vengeance of the Lord, divine exchange. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon us, your people. Anointed us to preach good news to the poor. It's time for those in poverty to hear good news. Those with heaviness to receive the garment of praise. Those who have got the ashes of their life, Lord, to receive the beauty. Those, oh God, who are full of loneliness, oh God, the oil of joy poured out from the storehouse of heaven onto the heads of people, Lord. We thank you for that divine exchange. We thank you, we praise you, we glorify you, we magnify you, we enthrone you, Lord. We thank you for the mighty works of God that have been established through what has been done today, Lord. We give you glory, we give you praise, we give you honor. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen.